Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to the document that we began to look at this last Sabbath, we're going to look to complete the, the reading of this document and our discussion from it and likely go on to one other document before we fully return into our study in Zechariah chapter 4. Given what we have been addressing this last week and the questions that have been raised, shall we now, in prayer, seek our, our Heavenly Father to ask Him for His guidance and His direction so that we may more clearly understand what it means to have Christ's character and its import for us at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we seek you. We ask, Father, for our sins to be forgiven. Our sins are many. We need you, Father, to direct us so that we might be cleansed and might be seen as being fit vessels for your spirit. So that we may walk upon the path that you would send us. We may walk according to the light that you have presented Forgive us of our sins. Direct us now. Help us so that our minds may be open and ready to receive that which you would send to us. Bless us now. Guide us in all things. I ask, Father, for your blessing upon those that might join with us today. And for those that will view this presentation later. May your will be done. We pray for your strength. We pray for your wisdom. We ask for your guidance. And for this, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now, we're going to look to finish this, this document. We're going to recap just a few of the, of the paragraphs from this last week and continue discussing them. Brethren, we are living in perilous times. In the fear of God, I tell you that the true exposition of the scriptures is necessary for the correct moral development of our characters. When heart and mind are worked by the Holy Spirit, when self is dead, the truth is capable of constant expansion and new development. When the truth as it is in Jesus molds our characters, it will be seen to be truth indeed. As it is contemplated by the true believer, it will grow brighter, shining in its original beauty. As we behold it, it will increase in value, brightening its own natural loveliness, quickening and vivifying the mind, and subduing our selfish and Christ-like coarseness of character. It will elevate our aspirations, enabling us to reach the perfect standard of holiness. I don't find a single portion that I cannot agree with in this, in this particular paragraph. Now, does anyone have a comment or a thought based upon what is presented here? Well, one of the things we see here is that there is um, uh, a parallel between the development of character and the unfolding, unfolding of truth. Correct. And, um, you know, this in the context of what we what we studied this last week, um, 
it, it, I mean, it shows that either we have been advancing in character as God has been leading us. And if he hasn't been leading us, then we've not been developing in character. Right. Now, what say you, the others that are here in this meeting? A lot of this is going to be dependent upon your yeah. thoughts as well. I'm sorry to cut in there, but <laughs> I'm just thinking of Christ's word, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And we can have all the stuff in our heads that we want, but we have to realize that studying the word is supposed to lead to dying of self, dying of the carnal self and restoring of the spiritual self. And that's the route I want to take. Okay. We have yet to learn that the whole Jewish economy is a compacted prophecy of the gospel. It is the gospel in figures where from the pillar of cloud, Christ himself presented the duty of man to his fellow men. In Christ's words to his appointed agencies, both in the Old Testament and in the New, the Christian virtues are plainly brought out. Christ scattered the precious grains of truth throughout all his teachings. All will find them to be as precious pearls, rich in value, if they will practice the principles plainly laid down. The Old Testament, Testament is the ground where practical godliness was first sown. This was repeated in Christ's words to his disciples. Here within this paragraph, we are again seeing the premise that all of the prophets speak with one voice. There is no disagreement among them. Our lack of faith, the absence of the love and respect that is due to all the children of God, detracts from our influence and makes our labors of none effect. When the power of the Holy Spirit is appreciated and felt in the heart, far less of self will be exhibited, and far more of the feeling of human brotherhood revealed than is seen in the tenderness of Christ. Our work is not to exhibit self, but to let the Holy Spirit work in us. Thus, self-deceived men and women may be rescued from their delusion. I cannot forbear to tell you in the name of the Lord that you are not on safe ground unless the truth with its living principles teaches you your danger, bringing you every day closer to Christ in character. Many supposed conversions are talked of and published, which cannot stand the stress of trial and temptation. Under difficulty, the test of God's word reveals them to be faithless, envious, jealous, evil, full of evil surmisings. Many, many are stony ground hearers. They have no depth of spiritual experience. They do not apply the truth to their hearts and their consciences. Self in its unsanctified elements is still alive, revealing <clears throat> attributes which strengthen evil in the place of repressing it. Self is not crucified. There is a lack of pure tone piety, and this lack makes them weaklings in the army of the Lord when they might be giants if they were willing to be converted to the truth. True conversion is divine and yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Here, Sister White is telling us she cannot hold back 
that these principles are to be teaching us our danger. Teaching me my danger. And as these truths are being revealed, that this should bring us every day into a closer walk with Christ. Are we seeing this in our lives today? Is this light being shown to those around us? I am afraid for our churches. I tremble before God on their account. We have light on the scriptures, and we shall be held accountable for the light that is not cherished. The works of men do not harmonize with the truth they have received. There is far too much of the human element in our methods and our plans. We do not depend on the Spirit of God to work with its transforming energy upon the life. We are deficient in faith which is invincible and mysterious. The efficacy of the simple truth is weakened by the course of those who do not purify their souls by obeying the truth. So here, Sister White is expressing that the church itself, while it has great light, has not been cherishing the light that has been presented. Are we seeing that in the movement yet today? Yes, we are. If we are seeing it in the movement yet today, are we seeing this in ourselves today? Yes, we are. Okay. We are being given instruction so that this light may be accepted within our lives and may be accepted and cherished within our experience. The secrets of the Lord are with them that fear him and keep his covenant. We need faith in God that under the sanctifying power of God's word, the principles of human brotherhood may be manifested. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance. Its power upon minds and hearts will bring pure truth from the Holy Word. And sound doctrines brought into actual contact with human souls will result in sound and elevating practices. We need the working of the Holy Spirit upon the mind and the character. The truth as it is in Jesus must be cherished. Then Christians will not be Christians in name only. The love of Christ will pervade all of their actions. It's interesting for me because the title of this document is The Truth in Jesus. We are being shown that if we accept what we just addressed in paragraph 27, then in paragraph 28, if we are not willing to be guided by the Holy Spirit, if we are not willing to accept the truth from his word and practice and accept sound doctrines, then we are not Christians. We are not truly following Christ. How many are there that believe all I have to do is keep the Sabbath and I'm Christian? How many are there that believe all I have to do is be a vegetarian and I'm a Christian? Yet are we practicing the type 
of sound doctrine that shows not only our love for one another, but that we are truly cherishing what Christ has done for us. I know and am afraid, as I realize, that with hundreds, religion is a cold, formal thing. Many professed Christians will lose eternal life that is in, within reach of all. Every provision has been made for them, but they have no hungering or thirsting after righteousness. There is no room in the soul either for the Spirit of God or for the Word of God. What room have we made within our souls today? This paragraph is frightening. And if we read and accept what she is saying here, how many of us would have to admit that many elements that she is addressing here we find within our own hearts i have to admit that i found it within mine so if that's the case have i have i been cleansed enough to be have to to allow the holy spirit to take take residence in my heart Truth is delicate, refined, elevated. When it molds the character, the soul grows under its divine atmosphere. The truth is to be partaken of occasionally, right? No, every day. Every day. What does that mean to us? If we're not willing to partake of the truth on a daily basis, if all we're doing is relying on someone else once a week to give us glimpses of the truth, are we going to then be partakers of the truth on a daily basis? No. Thus we eat the words of Christ, which he declares are spirit and life. We find this in John 6, 63. The acceptance of the truth will make every receiver a child of God and heir of heaven. Truth that is in the heart is not a cold, dead letter. The spirit of God is truth. The Lord is dishonored when those who profess to serve him reveal a character that is a denial of their faith. Consider that final sentence carefully. The Lord is dishonored when those who profess to serve him reveal a character that is a denial of their faith. Is it your goal? Is it your purpose? Is it your desire to honor God? Yet, it is being said that many dishonor God who take on the name of Christ who take on God's name in vain by revealing a character that denies their faith there is fullness of joy in the truth there is a nobleness in the life of the human agent who lives and works under the vivifying influence of the truth. Truth is sacred and it's divine. 
It is stronger and more powerful than anything else in the formation of a character after the likeness of Christ. When it is cherished in the heart, the love of Christ is preferred to the love of any human being. This is Christianity. Thus truth, pure, unadulterated truth, occupies the citadel of the being. This is the life of God in the soul. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Ezekiel 36, 26. What is a citadel in your estimation? What is another word for a citadel? I always thought, thought it was like a fortress. Could a citadel also be a tower? Sure. I address my brethren. Do not anchor where you now are, for you are far from the place where the anchor will hold. The truth of the word of God is regarded by some as a fetter from which the human soul tries to break. But the truth is what makes men free. If the truth, therefore, shall make you free, writes Paul, in brackets, John, you are free indeed. Now, it's interesting that here, Mrs. White is placing both Paul and John together. For this is found in John 8, 32 and 36. The truth as it is in Jesus separates man from his sins, from his hereditary and cultivated tendencies to, to wrong. Many poor souls are puffed up with pride and self-importance. If they do not change their position, they will be tempted still more strongly to display their supposed qualifications of power. Last night, one of the things that Theodore was presenting was situations from an experience. How many times do we become puffed up, either from attending an evangelist? an evangelistic series or from thinking and believing that because this is being presented to us, that we have some great secret that others don't have. Are we to become prideful in this way or are we to be sharing with others the opportunity that they have to understand and come to know the Christ that we purport to know. Oh, that all who shall read these lines would search their hearts as with a lighted candle and define if they can what true conversion is. The Lord never created man to lord it over his fellow men. This lording propensity has been indulged to the ruin and wreck of humanity. The souls of those who have indulged this propensity are cast in a mold that Satan himself has made to fashion their characters. Every soul carries his credentials with him. By his actions, he shows whether or not he is under the power of the Holy Spirit or whether he is striving to climb over his fellow men to rule or to ruin. Are we to lord it over others when we are studying and we find something that, that they may not understand? Are we to seek to have a character that is designed for us by the adversary? or one that is presented before us by Christ and by our Heavenly Father. Whose character do we have? 
who of us are truly converted. With great truth we have been privileged to receive, we should, and under the Holy Spirit's power, we would become channels of light. Praise God for that promise. We could then approach the mercy seat and seeing the bow of promise, kneel with contrite hearts and seek the kingdom of heaven with a spiritual violence that would bring us, it would bring its own reward. We would take it by force as did Jacob. Now, who was it that could approach the mercy seat? Speaking on the Day of Atonement symbolism, who was it that could approach the mercy seat? The high priest. Are not those that are truly converted, that would stand as Christ did in this world, being given the opportunity to then spiritually approach the mercy seat. Is this not a promise that we are all being offered? That we, right. Okay. What does it mean that we should take this by force as did Jacob? How did Jacob take this by force? He stole it from the brother. Did he not hold on to Christ and state, I will not let you go unless you bless me? Yeah, okay. That's true. How many of us are willing today to wrestle with the angel of the Lord? to wrestle with Christ and to say, as the light is breaking, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then the message we bore would be the power of God unto salvation. Our supplications would be full of earnestness, full of a sense of our great need, and we would not be denied. Was Jacob denied the blessing of God when he wrestled there with Christ? No, he didn't. And nor, nor, was, nor was Peter when it looked like he was going to drown. He said, Lord, save me. The truth would be expressed by life and by character and by lips touched by the living coal from God's altar. When this experience is ours, we shall be lifted out of our poor cheap selves, which we have cherished so tenderly. We shall empty our hearts of the corroding power of self and shall be filled with praise and gratitude to God. We shall magnify the Lord, the God of all grace, who has magnified Jesus Christ. He will reveal his power by making us sharp sickles in the harvest field. The usefulness of workers in any lines depends on whether they have an abiding Christ. Without me, said Christ, ye can do nothing. John 15, 5. Workers for God should be filled with his spirit. The real usefulness of the workman will be manifested by his spiritual discernment, which will testify that he has been taught of God that his eyes are not blinded to the interest of the cause and the work of God or to the elements of true Christianity. By their faith and their labor of love, true Christians give evidence unquestioned that their work is wrought in God. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, 
writes Paul, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men there were among you for your sake. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. Paul lived the gospel that he preached. And if our ministering brethren will live the truth, they will be loving, kind, tender, lowly in heart, unpretending, earnest, and devoted. Their works will be their credentials. There would be 100-fold more conversions than the record shows today if God's workmen were what they should be. God demands truth in the inward parts. The spirit of those in the ministry must correspond with the truth preached. Are we all not to be ministers unto God? If we are, our spirit must correspond with the truth that is being preached. There can be no casting out of other brothers and sisters. There can be no spiteful, harsh words. Will the workers in the various lines of God's work ponder these things? Are you going to think about this? A large share of the shallowness of the work is the result of the shallowness of the workers. When the Spirit of God works, something will be done, and in a much larger degree than we have yet seen. Where is the power of the workers? Where is the demonstration of the Spirit? Where is the assurance of faith? There is a sad deficiency, a great lack in the preaching of God's word. Much fluent talking must be done. Much cleverness may be shown in the presentation of different points of truth. All this has been seen. Ears are gratified. A present commotion is excited. But where are the souls? Where is the holy unction? the living earnestness, the deep, deep moving of the Spirit of God. Where are those who expound the truth by upholding staunch, correct principles? Oh, that God would impress his ministers with the need of being thoroughly converted and led to look away from themselves. Oh, that he would impress them with the need of an abiding Christ, that there would be a revival of the Holy Spirit. How many times do we hear that all we need are showers of blessing? All we need is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yet, how many of us are so impressed of our need of a Christ living within us? Of an abiding Christ? The power of the Holy Spirit is needed to chase away our unbelief and our unchristlike attitude attributes. We must see our need of a physician. We are sick and we do not know it. May the Lord convert the hearts of his workmen. When there is a converted ministry, then look for results. What does that mean to you? What is being seen within this paragraph? Mrs. White continues. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, Dwight. Thinking of what, what she wrote when she said that you have to clear away with the rubbish from the door of your heart and then Christ will, will enter. And that's what we need to be working on constantly.
The next paragraph states it very clearly. You cannot convert your own hearts. Can any of us change our character? Can any of us change our hearts? Not at all. You cannot convert your own hearts. This work can only be wrought by the Holy Spirit. In every stage of the work, let the educators advance, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I have yet to see another passage in the Bible, another singular verse that Mrs. White has written upon so much as I have at this time with Zechariah 4.6. If this work can only be brought forth by the Holy Spirit, then we must be willing to allow for all of the impediments, all of the sin, all of the dust, all of the dirt that we have allowed in our characters to be removed. Because can the Holy Spirit live where there is even one spot of defilement? The question has been asked, what kind of vessels does the Spirit ordinarily use? What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When the workers in any branch of the work labor in self, they put upon themselves a yoke which Christ does not cooperate with them in carrying. Can you show me a, a more direct paragraph than this? If we're going to continue to work in our own ways, this becomes a yoke that Christ will not cooperate with us in carrying. Would you rather carry the yoke with Christ helping you? Or would you rather be crushed under one that you are choosing, choosing to carry yourself? What kind of vessels are meat for the master's use? Empty vessels. What does this mean to you? What are you seeing here, brothers and sisters? When we empty the soul from every defilement, we are clean vessels. Are we emptied of self? Are we cured of selfish planning? Whereby we are to be given every favorable chance while others get along as best they can? Oh, for less self self-occupation may the lord purify and cleanse his people may he purify and cleanse the teachers and the churches may the lord purify and cleanse the movement the lord has given a rule for the guidance of all from this standard there can be no careless departure but there has been and still is a swerving from righteous principles. How long shall this condition of things exist? How can the master use us as vessels for holy service until we empty ourselves and make room for the spirit of God to work? This admonition was written by Mrs. White in 1897. Yet only portions of this admonition were ever published. 
I believe this document has a lot to say for us today. Any thoughts or comments as we prepare to move on? Okay. Now. I noted this morning that we have the next letter being published. Number six. Now, we're going to work hard to keep up with a lot of things over the next several weeks. The initial quote within this letter is, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Revelation 11, 11, and 12. Now, in the studies we've done in the past, how would we view Revelation 11, 11? This is a reference uh, to, well, the symbol of 11, 11. It ties us to Daniel 11, 11. It ties us to the story of Joseph, 11 years and 11 years, making 22 years, 11 uh uh, generations before the flood and then after uh, the flood to going into Egypt. So there's lots of symbols attached to it having to do with restoration. Would we also look at this as being a, a type of a doubling? Well, it's a type of a doubling, but I mean, you can't just take it by itself. There has to be other things. Right. I'm not looking to take it just by itself. Yeah, yeah, because there's lots of times you have verses that are double, but it's the consequence of it being eleven eleven uh, that gives it greater significance than if it was just like, you know, a verse nine nine or five five or something like that. Okay, after being trampled down in the street, Elijah and Moses receive the Comforter, and they then stand upon their feet. Ezekiel's valley of bones first hear a noise and then experience a shaking but they were still without breath so i prophesied as i was commanded and as i prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone and when i beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them. Ezekiel 37, 7 and 8. When the bodies that have been reconstituted, they hear the message of the four winds. Now that sentence structure is a bit odd for me. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Ezekiel 37, 9 and 10. All of the prophets identify the end of the world 
So the passage from Ezekiel produces a dilemma for those who wish to avoid the message of Revelation 11's two prophets. <clears throat> of course, for those who wish to reject the message, the easiest lie they can tell themselves is that Revelation is just a history that presents the French Revolution and it has no end of the world application. But if you accept the premise that even Revelation 11 identifies the end of the world, then you must reconcile the fact that the mighty army at the end of the world that represents the third angel's message is a loud cry, is identified as being dead and resurrected in advance of their standing up as God's army. Now, when did the French Revolution take place? Just prior to the time of the end. Right. But it was a symbol that we came to understand was leading us to the time of the end, right? Right, yeah. So it, uh, yeah, that's... Because this is this is a big problem. This interpretation here, um, trying to apply it to our time in this way, it wouldn't really fit. You can't Wait. have Go ahead. Moses and Elijah slain in uh, in our time in in where he's placing it in the lines. The way that I have read through this letter, it would seem that the premise is being used that Moses is typifying the Millerite time frame and that Elijah is typifying the work of Future for America. Now, this is not something that has been presented before. This was not a presentation that had been made before anywhere from 1989 to 2020. Now, if I am wrong, and Elder Jeff had made this type of presentation before, then I'm willing to stand corrected. But I'm having difficulty with the sentence. For those who wish to reject the message, the easiest lie they can tell themselves is that Revelation is just a history that represents the French Revolution. Because at no time have we ever made this kind of an application. Yeah, no time have we ever made an application that um, Revelation 11 because that's really what it's talking about. Um, I, I mean, it, it it's dealing with the whole history of uh, Millerite history. It's addressing Millerite history. Now we repeat Millerite history, so we can apply these that history once it's been fulfilled. We can see its its repetition. But I I don't understand how he can place place it in our time in the way that he's doing it. Any other comments here? I, 
I mean, I mean, this is very relevant to what we're studying in Zechariah, of course, right? Yes, it is. Um, and, you know, when you look at Revelation chapter 11, uh, you're going to be brought to the measuring of the temple. We place this at the end of the 1260 years. Right. So if you're going to make an application of this history, if you're going to say it's repeated in our time, you would have to show the whole line. You can't just pay, pick part of it out of there and just put it in, uh, you know, to 2013 to 2020. You can't just take those, uh, you know, seven years, just and and you know, out of context, and say that this applies to that. It just makes no sense. Now, in this next passage from Ezekiel thirty-seven. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and will cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I am I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Christ ascended into heaven with a cloud, and he returns with clouds. And the clouds represent angels. Moses and Elijah ascend up into heaven in a cloud that represents the message of the third angel that flies in the midst of heaven at the Sunday law in the United States. Moses and Elijah ascend up into heaven at the Sunday law in connection with the message of Islam. I mean, this is one of the most illogical paragraphs I've ever seen. It's definitely a difficult paragraph. Yeah, I mean, it it doesn't follow from anything that's been said. Um, and and it just claims some things like the cloud that represents the message of the third angel that flies in the midst of heaven at the Sunday law of the United States, that that's Moses and Elijah sending up into heaven. So Christ returns with clouds, right? The clouds represent angels. That's fine. But Moses and Elijah send up to heaven in a cloud that represents the message of the third angel that flies in the midst of heaven at the Sunday law, of the United States. How does that, make any sense based on what's been said earlier even let alone make sense at all the point that I'm going to ask when we read Revelation 14 mm -hmm. are the angels ascending or are they descending are they said exactly yeah and we know these angels are messages right correct so to talk about these this cloud that represents the message of the third, third angel that flies in the midst of heaven at the sunday law having to do with moses and elijah ascending up into heaven i mean I, i'm not even sure what this, that would mean that, and I mean, what does he mean of Moses and Elijah sending up into heaven at the Sunday law? Now, this, this section is called the Enzyme. So he's talking about these messages of Moses and Elijah somehow ascending up into heaven at the Sunday law, that these are the messages that had been slain. And they've been slain, 
you know, at July 18, 2020, uh, there's this period of time, I guess, in which these messages are attacked. But July 18, 2020 is the slaying of those messages, um, according to what he's written. But I don't see any parallel in Millerite history for any of this. No, nobody uh, has any contact with Elder Jeff. There's a question in the chat. Uh, that I, I don't know anybody who, who's talked to Jeff at all. I mean, we're, we're kind of doubtful whether Jeff actually wrote this. This doesn't really make any sense based on our knowledge of Jeff, his writing, his speaking, his thought process. Uh, I can't imagine him producing this, but um, if he is, it, it, it's really inexplicable. The one thing that I, I had come to accept over almost 20 years of hearing these messages is that as Elder Jeff would present he would present in a very structured progression. And you could follow that progression from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. I'm having a lot of difficulty with this because that same progression does not seem to be there. No, and I've read lots of his papers, seen lots of his videos. Um, yeah, so, so we, we have no idea what's going on with these articles. Uh, I mean, this is one that's obviously addressing uh, July 18, 2020. It's number six. Um, so this one, this one came today. Yes. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I had, I, I had looked last night, didn't see anything. I looked at 5:30 my time this morning and saw it. Okay, yeah. So, so that would be 6:30 my time. So, yeah, cuz I hadn't seen it before then. Now, um You know, and this is a continuation of the paper that that he that he's been doing this series that he's been doing but even before um you know he had addressed things in this bold way there was i was having trouble reading his articles um because they just didn't uh things didn't make sense to me like even when he was writing about things that we we sort of could agree on it, it didn't it didn't seem to make sense how these um these were being laid out so so this one here number six um yeah i haven't read it all yet so i mean that's what we're doing but it uh you know so far i haven't seen any any sense in any of this so, so we, we've been struggling with this, you know, for those who are watching here now, like we've been trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense what he's writing. Yeah, normally when I'm, when I'm reading something, because I read a lot of stuff on the internet and, um, you know, a lot of different research and things. And, and you can usually see a person's art argument and you can see where they're going wrong and you can sort of uh, in your mind correct what's happening. I'm even having a hard time doing that with these because there's just isn't the type of logical continuity to make sense out of what he's saying. That is, I can't see where he's going to go. And then when he gets there, I can't see how he got there. I, I, I don't know if you agree with me on that. Well, <clears throat> the the thought that comes to my mind 
do we serve a God of confusion? No. No. I, I will state it this way. I am very confused by what I am reading here because the progression that has been being presented within these papers mm -hmm. is very unlike the documents that we have been reading from Sister White. Mm -hmm. Now, as I have stated before, especially where it comes with Sister White, I've always been one that I, I turn to the source documents. This is why when we run across something that has not been fully published, as was the document we finished this morning, reading the statements that are made within that document from paragraph to paragraph to paragraph is very important <clears throat> because it helps us to understand and to see the progression of thought that she is presenting. Right now, I am struggling. I'm struggling mightily to be able to make sense of what I'm reading. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm struggling with. It, it's like, and I usually don't have trouble understanding what somebody's writing. But I, I can't follow the progression here. Okay. As it continued, Isaiah brings many of the truths connected with this history. In the very same passage that Jesus referenced to identify his work, when Jesus quoted from Isaiah, he employed the prophet Elijah and Elisha as examples of a prophetic message not being received by their, con their own countrymen. And it immediately brought those of the church in Nazareth to anger, and they sought to kill him. When Elijah is raised to life with a message of good tidings, persecution begins. Persecution begins at the Sunday law. Now this portion from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61.1 to 62.12. I would suggest to all of us that we read this today, consider it, but now we're going to go into the balance of what was being written here. The Lord enters into an everlasting covenant with the 144,000 who have previously been forsaken, but then becomes a city that is not forsaken. They were desolate and dead in the street Isaiah identifies them as priests of the Lord and the Lord's ministers, a holy people, and the watchmen on the walls of Zion. In contrast with those who rejoiced over their dead bodies, God then rejoices over them as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. The bride has then been made ready. Just as the promise to Philadelphia, the Lord gives them a new name, and he identifies their name as Hepzibah and Beulah. Hepzibah means my delight is in her, and Beulah means to marry. The Lord marries those represented by Elijah and Moses. Yeah, so this doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, the whole context, because we didn't read that passage. Um, in Isaiah 61. But, you want to read it then? Well, no, I don't want to read over the whole thing. But, I mean, we're familiar with the first part. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So Christ quote, quotes this. Um, and he says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He finishes with that. But he doesn't say the day of vengeance of our God, right, and to comfort all that mourn. So he he leaves out that part. So we're familiar with that idea, right? 
And, and then it refers back to some things you see in um, Isaiah 58, right? They shall build the old waste. They shall raise up former desolations, right? That, that idea is presented earlier. And then it's going to talk here in um, 62, <laughs> chapter 62, where it's going to talk about Hefziba and Beulah, right? That is this um, uh, says, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be any more termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hefziba and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now, in this section here, um, uh, this is going to be going back to um, Isaiah uh, chapter 7, right? Because it's going to talk about a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. This is going to be referring to the birth of Manasseh, whose mother's name is Hephzibah, right? So it's going to tell us that. And uh, so this connects, this connects to that prophecy. Now, what he's doing here is he's simply just taking some of these images from this story without any context and then trying to apply it to... Um, Elijah and Moses, um, you know, at the end of the world. It just, it's just not anything I've ever seen Jeff do before. Well, I, so, I, have, I, I appreciate your thought on that, okay. but I have, I, I have a, a question and I would like to hear input from the rest of us on this. There is a statement made in this paragraph. The bride has then been made ready. As I have studied through the spirit of prophecy, the reason that Christ has not returned is the bride has not made herself ready. Does Christ, does our Heavenly Father, ever choose to force someone to accept the gospel. No, he doesn't. How then can the bride be made ready if the bride is not choosing to be ready. Yeah, well, we know that the bride has made herself ready. There's going to be a point in which the bride has made herself ready. Right. But, um, but that's going to be after the close of probation. That's the second coming. But see, in this, in this statement, it's saying the bride has then been made ready. It's not saying the bride has made herself ready. Yeah, well, it could mean that she made herself ready, right? Right. Okay. I mean, Right. I mean, it, it doesn't say what the cause of making her ready was, whether it was God or the bride herself. But so the bride having made herself ready, we know that that that's going to be that's still something in the future. You, you couldn't say that that's at the Sunday law in the United States. Right. right? Um, and then the idea that the promise of Philadelphia, you get a new name. Um, and then you're going to connect that to Hephzibah and Beulah. I mean, obviously, they were called desolate and forsaken, and now they're going to be called Hephzibah and Beulah. But you can't just then take that and place it. Um, and also with the whole thing with Philadelphia, uh, I mean, that's going to be the Millerite history. So if you're going to apply Philadelphia to our history, uh, you as I talked about before in the other studies, um, there's a messages to each of these churches. Philadelphia doesn't receive a rebuke, but there's nothing in the scripture that says that the final church then is Philadelphia. Right. 
the final church is Laodicea because that's who the final message is because that's the condition of the church. And that's why it needs that message. So it's just mixing together sort of in a blender, a bunch of different ideas without any logical coherence. And, and the Lord marries those represented by Elijah and Moses. Where? I've never seen such a, an idea in the Bible. Exactly. Right. So, so we've just put together a bunch of ideas, sort of duct tape together. They don't make any sense. Now, I know you want other people to comment instead of me all the time. No, I... Okay, the, the point is, I'm, I'm trying to make it so that the floor is open for mm -hmm. all of us. I mean, this, this is a collaborative study for all of us to be able to look these things over. You have given a lot, and it is greatly appreciated. All of us have to make decisions here. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, I'm, I'm being clear. I'm confused. And our Heavenly Father is not a God of confusion. It bothers me when I'm when I'm seeing something like this, and yes, I'm struggling with this. I'm wrestling with this. Now the thing is, we obviously care about Jeff. And yes. so see this kind of stuff coming from Jeff worries us. Yes. Not you know, the main thing is uh, I would my natural inclination would be to attribute this to mental decline, which. Uh, well, the source of the article is from Future for America website, so it's supposed to be Jeff iPhone is asking that to us. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a bunch of new articles that began um, at the end of July. And most of these were reviews of old ideas, though so I noticed that the articles weren't very well put together and I had a hard time following them, like following, you know, which is not typical of something that Jeff does. And so I'd asked even earlier, uh, probably near the beginning of uh, September, um, asked somebody, uh, was, was it at the beginning of at the end of July that these articles started? I think so. Anyway, um, so I asked somebody about what uh, they thought because it appeared to me that they, these articles weren't written very well. And, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what they said about it, but it seems to me that there's something going on here that doesn't make any sense. Because I wouldn't expect this from Jeff. So, so we're trying to make sense out of what's going on. Um, yeah, people can have time to read those. So if you go to futureforamerica.org, uh, you can look at the articles. So this is from a series of articles called July 18. Uh, uh, well, it's Future for America and July 18, 2020. This is number six. So we did some videos on number four and five. So that's Wednesday and Thursday. And prior to that, we did um, ones dealing with um, the eighth is of the seventh. So we are addressing the articles that uh, um, we're addressing Daniel chapter two. And we were trying to make sense out of what Jeff was saying there. But until we got to number four of the July 18, 2020, study that he's doing um it wasn't really clear what direction he was going so we didn't know what's the purpose of these articles why is he going over some of this old stuff and um so so people should read the articles and 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 give us some input of what they think is happening um but we don't know Right. So that, that's part of the problem that we have is that, um, you know, we're sort of in the dark about what's going on. I mean, 
Future for America hasn't really stated its clear objective of what it's trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and Jeff is usually very direct. So my experience with him is he's sort of an open book. He's telling you what he's thinking. He's not hiding anything. Uh, but these articles seem to be written in a much more, I can't think of a word for it, but just an indirect way of presenting what he wants to say. Um, until we get to number four, the, the art, article number four on July 18, 2020, do we get him you know, making statements like the school of the prophets should have been called the school of the false prophets and, and things like that. So, so I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I, I recommend people read these articles. Okay, Dwight, you can go on. Sorry about that. The work they are given is to prepare the way for Christ's second coming by preaching the good tidings of Christ and his righteousness unto the end of the world. Now, these two statements, good tidings and unto the end of the world, are given in quotation marks, meaning that they are quoting from something else. It's not just a premise. It's supposed to be a quotation, yet we're not citing the quotation. They yeah, are, now, yeah, you normally would think it's from what we just read. Right. Um, but... Uh, um, yeah, I don't um, don't quite see what he would be um, quoting. Um, so I don't know. They have been anointed by the Comforter in the outpouring of the Spirit, and will then be lifted up as a standard as. A great voice from heaven says unto them, come up hither. They will yes. then be. Yeah. So the good tidings would be the beginning of this quote. Okay. Um, right. He's anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And then behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Uh, Say ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. So that's where he's getting the quotations. Marks. Okay. Um, but. Unto the end of the world there is actually referring to all the world. Right. It's talking about the end of time. Um, right. So it, 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 it probably should have been translated as ends of the world. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion. It's, it's actually a reference to, uh, to everyone. So. Um, I'm not sure if Jeff is understanding that or is, or he's just using it as reference to the end times. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's what the quotes are for there. All right. They will then be as a crown of glory and a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord. Zechariah identifies the same crown as an ensign. Ensign while also placing the event during the time of the latter rain. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so that the Lord shall make bright clouds, and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Zechariah 9, 16 to 10, verse 1. So a comment in the chat has just said the article should be read as author unknown. Now, it says that it's Jeff Pippinger on the Future for America website. Right. So so I would think that's about as close as you can get to it being signed.
I mean, if I if I go back up to this just for a second, right here. Yeah, it says by Jeff Pippinger. Mm -hmm. So this this is part of the reason for the confusion. They will be the flock of his people, but the Lord has a second flock who are then still in Babylon, who he will also call. Their work will be to rebuild the old waste places and the desolations of many generations. They will be those who return and establish the old paths. He says reestablish the old paths. Reestablish the old paths that have been rejected and covered up within Adventism and without Adventism. They will return to the Millerite foundational truths and present them in their purity to Laodicean Adventism. And they will also present a message to those outside of Adventism concerning the old truths connected with God's law, especially the Sabbath. In doing so, they will use the histories of many generations to illustrate the new history. Their work will take place during the latter reign, when the judgments of God are in the Lamb. When the Lord with his right hand lifts them up as an ensign, <clears throat> the entire world that had previously rejoiced over their dead bodies lying in the street will see the ensign and hear the watchman's warning trumpet. As ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers of the earth see ye, when he lifted up on <clears throat> an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. Isaiah 18, verse 3. In chapter 11 of Revelation, when those who had been rejoicing over their dead bodies see them stand up, great fear fell upon them which saw them. <clears throat> Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not a mighty man, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited, and he shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. Isaiah 31, 8 and 9. Here, another premise is being addressed. All the prophets' testimonies come together in the book of Revelation. I don't see that we can disagree with that. The Assyrian represents the king of the north in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, who comes to his end with none to help. When the 144,000 who are God's watchmen blow the trumpet, the entire world will hear and be afraid. Those represented by the two prophets will be anointed by the comforter to preach the good tidings that are the tidings out of the east and out of the north that troubles the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, and that marks the beginning of the persecution of the Sunday law crisis. At that time, the Gentiles will respond to the message to come out of Babylon and come and join the priests of the Lord, who are also represented as a root of Jesse thus identifying the biblical methodology that they will use to present the warning message unto the Gentiles. Here, Isaiah 11, 10 to 12 is quoted. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign for the of the people. So it shall the Gentiles seek. 
And to it shall the Gentiles seek. And to it shall the Gentiles seek. Thank you. And his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The Lord gathered his people on September 11th, 2001, with a message that identified Islam's attack as the arrival of the third woe. The Lord gathers his people again a second time after they have been dead in the street. When he does so, these gathered are identified as the outcasts of Israel, the dispersed of Judah. They were cast out into the streets on July 18th, 2020, but they are gathered a second time to be the ensign that gathered God's other flock that are still in Babylon. The gathering of those still in Babylon begins at the Sunday law in the United States, which is the second of two voices in Revelation 18. Yeah, so Jeff here is referring back to his earlier article because he, he's talking here about Moses and Elijah being slain and they're going to be cast out into the street. And it's the beast from the bottomless pit that's that from uh, 2013, so after 2012, to July 18, 2020, that do the slaying. So he's he's he argues in the other article that um, that it it was the people who came into the movement with false ideas that are representing the beast from the bottomless pit. And um, and so Moses and Elijah. That is the message that that Jeff had been given had been slain with July 18, 2020. And so, uh, so he, and he refers to that as the, a parallel to the first disappointment. So there's some problems there trying to say, well, July 18 is not a valid date, uh, but yet he still uses it. And so we're still confused about that. Right. So this, so the idea is that they're gathered first, September 11th, 2001, they're going to be slain. That message is going to be slain of Moses and Elijah on July 18, 2020. And then in the future, it's going to be uh, the message of Moses and Elijah is going to be gathered together again. It's going to be resurrected, which it seems that that's what he thinks he's doing. He's resurrecting the message that was slain. So that's as far as we could understand it. He doesn't unless he starts to explain this further in the article. Well, the issue that that we're trying to address is there are there, there are some definite problems with the way that this is being presented. This is going to require a lot of prayer it's also going to require a lot of discussion among all of us because if if we accept what the scripture reads that god is not a god of confusion then these things should be very easy for us to understand Well, it doesn't necessarily always mean things that are easy to understand. Some things are complex and they take time. Yes, agreed. The thing is they, they should be logical and consistent and and any new light should be consistent with old light and it should make things clearer. Correct. 
yeah, so we're, you know, we're trying to examine this and trying to make sense out of it. Um, you know, obviously I'm having trouble, but maybe, maybe that's a problem with me, not with what's being read. So people have to read it for themselves. It's a lot of material to read, but, you know, I would suggest reading this, this series of articles. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to take some time and how this is going to affect the movement. I mean, one of the problems I have is we just don't have the contact with Jeff. So it's not like he started the movement and we can now just, you know, write him and, and he's going to respond. He's just putting out the articles at this point. So it doesn't allow for any feedback. You can make comments in the articles, uh, but those comments, I guess, are going to be vetted in some way, whether they're even going to place them. I haven't seen any comments on any of the articles. It doesn't mean that there isn't, but I haven't seen anything yet, but I haven't looked over the last few days. Right. So I'd have to go through all. Um, in the there's some think, in the previous um, articles, but not in these uh, new ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Pat Rampey made a comment in one article, um, but but I'm not sure if it was in the article, you know, at the article or whether it was just when he posted it on Facebook. But yeah, so, um, yeah. Do you know which ones have some comments on them? I believe okay. I looked at several of the uh, leaders of the seven and there was several comments on one and then one comment on the other one okay yeah so so i can take a look at those see what kind of comments are being allowed i haven't tried putting a comment myself so okay thanks for that thank you very much now, we have come to the close of our time together today. I would suggest all of us be able to read, the, read through these articles and be prepared for our study tomorrow. They're, the way that the, the articles are coming out right now, we're seeing them a little faster. And we need to be able to keep up with this because as we come back to our study this next Sabbath, we are now going to consider to return to what we're going to see from Zechariah 4. Any other thoughts or comments or questions at this time? Um, yeah, I have seen that Pat Rampey has made comments on three different articles, but that's all I've seen so far, but I haven't looked at every article. Okay. All right. Thank you for each of your efforts and your input today. May our Heavenly Father provide us all with wisdom and blessing so that we might be able to make sense of so many of these things that are being presented. Shall we now close our time with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open and study from your word. We know that you are not a God of confusion. We know that you understand the end from the beginning. You understand our weaknesses. You understand the darkness that has been upon our minds. Direct us now on this Sabbath, help us that we may give the effort to understand that which you would have us to know. Bless us today. Guide us each one. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. Now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.